Good morning, everybody. I usually uh, would wait for people to log on, but I also assume that uh, people can log on when they have time later. I do see some people coming on, sipping my coffee and my uh, definitely awesome dad mug this morning. I don't know if I'm definitely an awesome dad, but I do like being a dad. Very thankful for my children. Well, good morning, everybody, as you log on. We're going to be in uh, Psalm 17 this morning, the 17th Psalm. <clears throat> I want to apologize. My, uh, I'm, I'm fighting uh, whatever's going around. So if I uh, hack and cough or something like that, uh, just duck, and it should be fine. Um... 17th Psalm, a couple days ago, one of my buddies on Facebook, one of my friends also a supporting church pastor, uh, posted this verse, Psalm 17, 15, where David, at the end of his prayer, prays, As for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. And I've been thinking about that. I, uh, I've always loved the Psalms, and I've spent many, many times, many days and hours in the Psalms in my life. And uh, this Psalm has been always very special to me. And so I want to I wanna kind of talk the idea, based on this Psalm, of the difference between satisfaction and contentment. Satisfaction and contentment, because I think one of the biggest places that we... I don't know if it's the biggest, but it's one of the big ones. I guess since I'm talking about it, it seems like the biggest. One of the big areas of life where we we get tripped up and where we get discouraged and, and we can begin to be taken down by the enemy is not knowing the difference between satisfaction and contentment. Uh, or rather, confusing the two and chasing the wrong one in our life today. Notice as David is praying here, and I encourage you to read the whole psalm. But uh, David is praying, and uh, this is a pretty heavy psalm. It's a prayer. From beginning to end, it's a prayer. And as we read verse number 17, David is coming to the end of his prayer. David's coming to the conclusion of his prayer. So we could say that this is where his prayer has brought him. And as David is praying and he's pleading, and, and uh, it's I'm going to give you a couple of thoughts out of the psalm, but... Understand, by the end of the psalm, David's enemies have not changed. Uh, David's circumstance has not changed. His struggle has not changed. His prayer didn't change those things. But his prayer changed David. And uh, what David expressed at the end of the psalm was a dissatisfaction in the present, but a contentment in the present because of the satisfaction of the future. And I think that's very important for us, and I'm, I'm, hopefully I can explain that better in a minute. But he said, But as for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. If you study the psalm, first uh, five verses, I, I, would, I would consider that to be the first section of the psalm and the first section of David's prayer. And in those first five verses, as David's praying and David's wrestling, he's, he's asking God things like, hear the right. He's telling God, verse 3, thou hast proved my heart, thou hast, uh, thou hast visited me in the night, thou hast tried me. Um, David's first dealings in his prayer uh, and his dealings, his struggles here was, was within. It started inside. And David was struggling from within, making sure that that God, when he heard it, him pray, that he was praying correctly. You know, it's work to pray right. <laughs> it's, it's work to pray correctly. It's easy to, uh, even James expresses it, you know, we, we ask and we have not uh, because we're asking to consume it on our lusts. We're, we're asking wrong. Uh, we're praying, yes, and, and in our prayers we're we're literally, we're asking God to give us something to, to consume on our lust. And if we look at that real close, sometimes uh, we're actually sinning in our, in our prayer. We forget who we're talking to. We forget what our purpose is. 
And so David begins his prayer uh, by seeking and looking within, and, and not just within as in, in a, a humanistic standpoint, but within before God, you know, God trying him, God, God dealing with his heart. And as he prayed, he started within. Notice he sought his answer from above in verses 6 to 19. In verse 7, he said, show thy marvelous loving kindness. He wasn't looking for uh, the wicked to change and to somehow bring him a blessing. He wasn't looking for his enemies to necessarily lay down their arms uh, and 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 surrender to him. And you know, we we've got to understand there's there's no end to the battle that we are fighting today. There's just there's not here, not on this earth. Uh, we have we have a struggle. We're, we we are uh, compassed by flesh. We have fleshly eyes and fleshly minds, and we have struggles, and you know we have to put to death this old man, and we have to put on the new man, and you know I I, I did that yesterday, right? <laughs> then this morning I tried to get up, or or just later on in the day something happened, and you know the battle is right there again. So I think it's important for us to distinguish between what our pursuit should be today. Are we looking for, or are we instructed to look for, are we promised satisfaction from God here? Or does God want us to find our satisfaction by being contented here, expecting satisfaction later, expecting satisfaction there? And that's how I kind of see the last verse of this psalm. I see this last verse as a place of victory in David's heart, a place of victory in David's life, something that made him peculiar from his enemies, uh, something that made him different, as he said in verse number 14, from men of the world. Uh, he said, but as, as for me, in verse 15. See, the men of the world, they do what they do. They're going to do what they do. But unfortunately, many times, uh, Christian people, maybe it's within a Christian culture, Maybe it's within a church setting, but we're not really all that different in our idea of satisfaction. And so we, we try to be satisfied here. Uh, we attempt to, to find that satisfaction in this life. We find it in our home. We find it in our uh, try to. We try to find it in our, our relationships and our families. And, and what we get frustrated because relationships can break down. They're fragile. Uh, our homes, uh, they're, they're not always as peaceful or as, as together as we want them to be. Uh, tragedy can come, strug struggle, strike, all kinds, of million things can come into our life. And uh, we find ourselves chasing something that's not attainable here. Um, you're not supposed to be satisfied. I'm not supposed to be satisfied. As we look at verse number 15, we could break it down this way. As for me, he said... I believe that's the exception of faith. What I mean by that is that's what made David the exception from men of the world. That's what made David an exception from his enemies and from those that were watching him and round about him, that encompassed him about. He could deal with things differently. He could, he could sit back in his struggle and find victory without the struggle ending. He could sit back and trust God in the storm while the storm was still raging. He could trust God to answer his prayer while his prayer was not visibly answered at the time. He could say, you know, men of the world are like this. My enemies are like this. They're doing this, and they're actively continuing to do that. But as for me, I'm going to do differently. I'm going to be differently. I'm going to conduct myself differently. See, Christian, what makes us peculiar is not the clothes we wear, um, or not the clothes we won't wear. I have I have dress standards. There's dress standards in my home. I believe in dress standards, modesty. But that's not what makes us peculiar. <laughs> Anybody that shops at the thrift store could be called peculiar. What makes us peculiar is what our faith does in our life. It's it's how it makes it makes us an exception to the world around us. If you act towards the disobedience of your kids like your lost neighbor does. 
if you act toward tragedy in your life like your lost neighbor does, if, if there's nothing conceivably different except the fact that you dress differently than your neighbor, there is not really an exception in your life. There's not really. It's not, you, 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 you know, we, we got to be careful that Christianity doesn't just become a subculture for us, and that's all it is. No, it's a walk with God. Uh, it's 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 knowing him through his word. It's having eternal hope. It's having the answers that the world needs. It's having the ability to have that exceptional uh, contentment in the middle of a storm or in the middle of a battle or in the middle of a fight, uh, knowing that satisfaction is not now, but it is coming. So he says, but as for me, but he also says, "But as for me, I shall behold. I will behold thy face in likeness, in righteousness." Notice he says, "I shall be satisfied." David, if you follow his life, and you follow his life based solely on the blessings of God on his life, God's blessings was all over David from the first time that you see him in Scripture. God's blessings was was over this young man as a shepherd watching his father's sheep. God's blessings was on him as an armor bearer in Saul's army as a as a player of the harp. He was God's blessings, I mean just was all over him, but at the same time, uh what else was all over him? Well, <laughs> strife and struggle and difficulty um how many years did he spend running from Saul? How many years uh, did his brothers, I mean, imagine that, uh, his brothers, he was anointed to be king in the midst of his brothers. Samuel made them all stand around and wait for him. I don't know that anybody really in that household uh, held David in high, high esteem. He was the youngest. He was ruddy. Uh, he was the keeper of the sheep. He wasn't the guy that went to war. He wasn't the guy that you know, was the biggest and the strongest. Um, and yet that's the guy that God chose out of all of his brethren. And then you see how his brothers acted at the battle uh, with, with uh, Goliath. You know, they, 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 were, not, they, they were not happy uh, with David. And so his life was just marked like anybody's life uh, that wants to live for God. Jesus said in the world, you'll have what? Not satisfaction. He said, you'll have tribulation. Uh, there's difficulty, there's struggle, uh, but in the midst of our struggle, we can have an exception the world can't have. David said, but as for me, he said, I shall be satisfied. Notice this, when I awake. First of all, I believe David's talking about a resurrection. I think it's amazing that David, Job, others in the Old Testament Maybe they did not understand it like you and I understand it, uh, but the resurrection is definitely taught there. Not only is the resurrection taught there, but our, or rather the children of God's transformation to be like God is also there. David said, when I awake with thy likeness, David was looking forward to something, uh, something that gave him an expectation of future satisfaction. Even in the middle of his difficulties, that's why the word when there, <laughs> when I awake, it's ex an expression of David's contentment in the moment, though he's not satisfied. He's not satisfied with what his enemies are doing to him. He's not satisfied with the battle that lay before him. He's not even satisfied with himself. I mean, if you ever read Psalm 51... Other psalms where David is repenting, and, and Bathsheba was not the only place David sinned, but it was an egregious one. David didn't find satisfaction in his lifetime, but he's found it now. I do not believe the Bible teaches that God's people should be chasing satisfaction, but unfortunately, especially Western Christianity, that seems to be what we do. We're chasing satisfaction because we never find ourselves satisfied. We always find ourselves in a battle. We always find ourselves in the difficulty. Then we get discouraged and we, we, we just don't understand the Christian walk. But yet, three, three verses I want to give you, three passages in closing for you to think about. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6. 
1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6. I think there's a couple of verses around there. But that's where Paul writes, Godliness with contentment is great gain. You see, contentment. David found contentment in his struggle because of this <clears throat> excuse me, because of the satisfaction he knew was coming. He found contentment in his struggle because of the satisfaction he knew was coming. And uh, Christian, if you are saved, if you understand what heaven is, if you understand, uh, you know, that the Lord is not, um, he's not, um, he's not unrighteous to forget. He's going to reward. He's going to, we're going to be with him one day. Um, we know that any kind of blessing here is going to pale in comparison to what that's going to be. Satisfaction is not to be here. We're to be godly and to have contentment. Uh, the second passage, 1 Timothy 6, 6, the second passage, Philippians 4, 11, Paul said, basically, I have learned to be content. I have learned. He said, I have learned in whatsoever state I am. And in that passage, he talks about being a base, that he talks about abounding. Uh, so in 1 Timothy, <clears throat> God commands us in the stuff of life, we're to be godly and content with our stuff. Food and raiment, it says there. Uh, Paul says in the, all the states of life that he found himself in, all of them, the good, the bad, the, the hard, the easy. Uh, I don't know what Paul ever did that was easy, but some things were easier than others. But he said, I, had, I learned contentment. I learned to be content. Why? Because, again, Paul, Paul knew satisfaction was coming. And then Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6 Hebrews 13, 5 and 6, speaking about the, the, the struggles of life, the difficulties. Uh, and there it says, we can boldly say that God is my helper. We need to be content. Why? Because, you know, in, in, in the, 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 even the terrible things of life, our God is sovereign and our God is, is, is loving. And, you know, I might not see it now, but I know, as David knew, I shall be satisfied. And that knowledge and faith in that knowledge should teach us contentment in this life. So I'm going to read that verse again in Psalm 17, verse 15. Scripture says, As for me, David, the end of his prayer, As for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. Um, there's a difference, Christian, between satisfaction and contentment. We're not to be chasing satisfaction in this life. We're to be, we're to be serving God. And we're to serve God knowing, knowing that satisfaction is going to come one day. So therefore, in our struggles, in our difficulties, our trials, we can have contentment here and now knowing satisfaction is going to come. Anyway, that's what I want to share with you today. I'm going to pray. <clears throat> God bless you all. I pray that you have a great Thursday. I think it's Thursday. <laughs> I'm getting a little bit better at the days these days. Let's pray. Father, we, uh, we thank you for your word. Lord, we do many times uh, sin against you because we begin to chase the wrong things. And Lord, we seek satisfaction uh, in, in the wrong place at the wrong time. Help us to know when satisfaction is to be. Help us to, to, to in the meantime, as we wait, learn contentment that we might walk with you, that you might hold us up in the storms. Help, help us to be better held up in the battles and the struggles of life. Lord, as we walk by faith and not by sight, Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters, my fellow preachers, that you would give them a great day of ministry and help them to serve you and live, with, live for you this day. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all. Have a great day.